Uh, Dr. Newbig received his Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the University of Michigan, uh, his MD from Harvard Medical School in the Harvard MIT program in Health Sciences and Technology, and PhD in Pharmacology from Harvard University. He then went on to train in internal medicine at the University of Michigan Hospitals before joining the faculty uh, at the, as in the Departments of Pharmacology and Internal Medicine. So uh, Dr. Newbig's project that he's going to update us on today was the recipient of the second donation grant made by the Bow Foundation to establish a line of mouse models at the Newbig lab at Michigan State. So he's going to give us an update on what he's found from his research so far. Thank you. Okay, well thanks very much. Um, I would really like to thank the Bow Foundation and everyone who was involved in putting this uh, amazing gathering together. I, I had the opportunity to attend the clinics yesterday and it was uh, very informative and it was great to meet, meet many of you. Um, so um, I'm currently now at Michigan State University um, with the, uh, the Sparty head now. I left Mi University of Michigan five years ago to, to defect to the, uh, the enemy up, upstate. But um, what I'm going to talk about now is um, GNA1 mutations primarily around our mouse models and um, the idea that um, beyond binary, thinking beyond loss of function and gain of function and thinking about the specific characteristics of the different mice we see, and it'll be very important and interesting for us to begin to understand how the, the unique characteristics we see in the mice relate to the characteristics of patients who have the same mutations. We hope it'll be correlated and will be the same, but we expect there will be some differences, but it'll be valuable to know how well the mice replicate the human phenotypes in movement and, and epilepsy. And we see some things that look promising. Okay, so um, you've already heard from, from Amy um, about what is GNA01. It's a signaling protein that carries signals from the outside of a cell to the inside of a cell, and it's very abundant in neurons, so we're mainly talking about brains and neurons. The receptors that turn on the G-alpha-O, the G-protein, um, are a member of the G-protein-coupled receptor superfamily. Um, about a quarter of all clinical drugs target GPCR, so there's a lot of drugs out there that could potentially be repurposed to either turn on or turn off the receptors and modulate the activity of the G-alpha-O, or the, the product of the GNA01 gene. So if you think about what mutations can do to the function of a protein, and you've already heard this, is that you have a normal functioning of a protein that may produce a signal. In our case, we've primarily looked at an intracellular messenger called cyclic AMP. But you can have loss of function where the protein isn't working as well and the signal is smaller, or you can have gain of function uh, where the signal is stronger. And so we've, these are two potential things that could happen. So um, Jade Feng is a PhD student in my lab, and she published this nice paper two years ago where she came up with the idea that loss of function mutations are in epilepsy and gain of function movement disorder. And I remember when she came to me and brought her data and said, these are all different mut mut mutant variants, mutant alleles or variants in GNA01. And she studied them in biochemical studies and assessed whether they had gain of function, relatively normal function, or loss of function. And she came and said, Rick, this is amazing. The gain of function alleles are primarily found in movement disorder patients. So the movement disorder patients primarily had increased function in this in vitro biochemical assay we were doing. Whereas the epilepsy patients primarily had loss of function or partial loss of function. There was one mutation which does very consistently show both epilepsy and movement disorder. There's a number that do this, but the, the G203R mutation um, very commonly shows both movement disorder and, and epilepsy. And this paper was published a couple, couple years ago. So what that means is that the epilepsy mutations primarily appear to have loss of function or reduced signaling, and the movement disorder mutations primarily seem to have gain of function or at least function relatively normally. So one thing that means with respect to therapeutics, because this G protein is downstream of receptors, if we could figure out which receptor to target, if we could increase signals through receptors that are related to epilepsy, 
we could potentially improve the situation in that case, but we need to know which receptor. Similarly, for the increased function or the gain of function mutations, which are typically found in movement disorder, we could use receptor antagonists to p reduce the movement disorder. And in fact, um, um, haloperidol and tetrabenazine and risperidone are all antagonists. So that does fit to some degree. Um, and so this idea is a, one way to think about how we can develop drugs for these conditions. So to move beyond just what we can do in, in vitro, we've developed four different human mutant GNAO1 mice that carry human mutant alleles. Um, and um, a couple of these were created in my lab but with funds from MSU and we've received support from the, the Bow Foundation to make a couple more of these. So um, we have two movement disorder mutations, the G203R, which is that one that has the unique property of having both strong epilepsy and movement disorder, and the R209H, which is pretty much a pure movement disorder um, uh, phenotype. We also have two epilepsy mutants that we've attempted to make, but unfortunately, the, when we made the mice with the epilepsy mutations, the mice would die at early ages, and we were not able to capture those strains and continue moving forward with those. And in fact, one of them, um, the D191 to 197, um, the, the mice developed seizures at day seven and typically would die before two weeks of age. We have a couple strategies to be able to potentially make movement disorder, make the epilepsy mutations, but they're much more challenging than the standard gene editing that we've been able to use for the movement disorder. So we do have these two mutations that lead to movement disorder in kids on the G203R and R209H in mouse strains that are viable and, and relatively easy for us to study. And I'm going to be telling you about those and about potential similarities and differences between the, the different mice that we generate. So to assess mice in, um, you know, mice are not little people. They, they are different. Some characteristics you can see in mice are, are um, replicable from people and others are more challenging. In general, in movement disorder models in mice, it's hard to show dystonia or chorea um, people typically use more gross measures like their general activity in open field. Um, you put the mouse in this open field and then monitor where it goes. There's a ro rotor rod where you put a mouse on a slowly rotating rod and see how long they can stay on before they fall off. It's sort of a, a measure perhaps of coordination or balance. Um, we have a, a very powerful system called a digigate which has a, a, a rapidly moving um, transparent treadmill and a high-speed camera that can assess where the foot placement is that allows us to very quantitatively assess gait, many properties of gait, and then we can use a simple grip strength measurement. <laughs> we, can also, we can also assess um, susceptibility to epilepsy by giving a low dose of a seizure-inducing agent. These mice, because they're in the movement disorder pattern, do not have spontaneous seizures but we can ask whether they're more susceptible to seizures by using this um, kindling or, or penylene tetrazole approach. So we recently published in the journal PLOS One our data on the G203R mutant. Um, what we found was in open field, this is just moving their, their, how far they move in 30 minutes, the first 10 or the next 20, and um, we basically saw not much of a difference with the G203R mutant mice in their general activity and, and movement. On the rotor rod, however, the males, but for some reason not the females, would fall off of the rotor rod faster. So there was a, a fairly robust difference between them in, in the rotor rod assessment. Similarly, in grip strength, the mice had a somewhat lowered grip strength, both for male, females and males in this case. This may relate to hypotonia. Um, we'll have to um, better understand that and, and, see, and see how that relates to the human disease. A lot of these functional studies were done by Cassie Larive, a master's student in my lab. Also on the digigate, the, the quantitative gait analysis, we put them on, this, on the treadmill at different speeds and then we measure how long their step is. So how far do they step? And so we find a, ver a very consistent reduction in stride length 
So what that means is that it got shorter stride length at the same speed, it got to move a lot faster to do that. And what we found was that the, the males, again, and not females, had a market, uh, significantly reduced stride length, and also they just couldn't keep up with the treadmill at higher speeds. This is the maximum speed they could run, so they would basically st stop being able to keep up with it at, a, at that point. So there was a clear gait abnormality in the G203R mutant mice. The other thing that I mentioned about this particular variant is that these children typically have both seizures and movement disorder. And what we did see was that in the kindling study, when we gave different numbers of injections of the seizure-inducing agent, the wild-type males were relatively protected, whereas the uh, mutant males developed seizures much more quickly, which is consistent with the idea that the G203R mutant children um, have, um, children carrying the G203R mutation have, um, have an epilepsy syndrome. So just summarizing, we have normal activity and they, they move into the center of the, the, the field relatively normally. Um, they have reduced balance or, or coordination in rotor rod, reduced grip strength, and altered, altered gait and increased seizure susceptibility for this particular mutation. So with the help of the Bow Foundation, we also were able to make the, G, the R209H mutation. And what we found here was really quite surprising to us. I, I was, we, um, when Cassie brought me these data, I said, look, you know, that's so different from what we've seen before. We've got to do it again. So this, the first data set was with 10 mice. We replicated it again with another 10 mice. And we saw this remarkable level of hyperactivity in the R209H mutant mice. Um, and so it'll be very interesting again to get the human mouse correlation as we collect more data, both from the natural history study that's just started this week and the, um, the registry. It'll be very interesting to see whether these um, things we see in the mice also uh, relate to what we see in children with the different, different variants. So, and this is just our G203R mutant data to compare, so there's clearly a very substantial difference between the R209H mutation and the G203R mutation. And this is looking at the center. Um, so when you put mice in this um, open field, you can see where they are over time, and the, the wild-type mice are reasonably happy to go into the center of the arena, whereas the mutants have a much decreased percent center time. And um, this is, was also very interesting to me in that um, this has been attributed in behavioral studies as having a correlate with anxiety. And I did see a question from one of the families, is anxiety a common feature of the GNAO1 mutations? And our data here suggests that it may not be universal, but may be found only with particular mutation variants. And again, correlating the clinical data with our, our mouse data will be very important and, and potentially helpful. What was surprising to us also was the R209H mutant mice seemed to have relatively normal rotor rod behavior. They didn't fall off faster, although there's some variation here. Um, they also had relatively normal grip strength. There were a few that were a little bit low, but they, they had more normal grip strength than the G203R. And again, how one quantifies hypotonia, I don't know to what extent one can get quantitative data in the clinic, but it'll be again interesting to see if there are differences among the different variants with respect to the different clinical, clinical um, features. Um, this again was our, our um, G203R mutation where both the rotor rod time and the grip strength um, were, were clearly, clearly reduced. Looking at the seizure phenotype, um, we, this is early days. We don't have um, as many data with this mutation. It appears that at least so far there's not a significant difference in the R209H mutant mice with respect to seizure propensity. And that's what we predicted, again, because children with the R209H mutation very infrequently have, have seizures. And again, here's the G203R where there's a strong difference, but we need more mice on this study to be absolutely sure that that difference, difference holds up. So the overall summary of these is that 
the activity is normal in this mutation, and it's actually quite different in, in the other mutation. Um, the um, rotor rod and grip strength are, are also different. There is a small de decrease in stride length with this mutation, and we believe that the seizure propensity may be less in the other. So we think that our mice may replicate some features of the human disorder and getting bet more quantitative data from the, the uh, clinical studies will help us see how well the mice are really correlating with the, the human condition. But it does suggest that there will be differences among the different variants. We sort of think of gain of function, loss of function. Um, I think it's more complex than that and, I, um, and can talk about that more if we've got some time to, with questions. So one thing that is valuable for us in terms of doing drug studies for preclinical testing, um, having very reproducible or having quantitative measures like the balance in this mutation and the hyperactivity in this, with this mutation will help us better identify which drugs may be able to modify those, those behavioral differences. So another thing that, that certainly is a common feature that we hear about is that the, um, we have differences in development, so developmental delay. So we wanted to ask whether the mice also seem to provide insights into the development delay. We're just getting started on these studies, but we have some preliminary data that looks promising. So when you look at mouse behaviors, there's a number of things that have been characterized as developing over about days five to 12 in the mice, which may relate to zero to six months or zero to one year in children. And there are a number of things you can measure. You put the mouse near the edge of the table and ask if they back away from it. And young mice don't do it so fast, and older mice do it faster. Um, you can see how long they'll hang on a, on a screen, and they may hang longer as they get older. Um, if you turn them over on their back, they'll very quickly flip back to being upright at older ages, but at younger ages they don't. And there's something called negative geotaxis. You put a mouse on a down-sloping uh, paper towel, and the older mice will very quickly turn around and face up because they don't like having their head down. And when we look at this, there's not much difference in these, but the writing reflex, it appears the, muta the, the mutant mice, and this is the um, R209H mutation, um, are somewhat delayed in their um, development of writing reflex. And the negative geotaxis, we have a statistically significant difference at day seven. Um, and so it does look as if we are going to be able to model at least some of the developmental changes um, with respect to these relatively crude mouse development readouts to be able to um, look, look at this. Okay, so um, the last thing I want to talk about is ways that we can move to more high throughput assessments of potential drug treatments. So we've got the mice, but it takes a really long time to do these drug testing in mice. That's the ultimate place we want to do it, but deciding which drug to try will be a very slow process if we have to do it in the mice. We've already started some of those. But we don't have enough data for me to share today. But we've begun to look at a, a high throughput method that looks at calcium oscillations. When neurons get activated, calcium in the neuron goes up, and that's relatively easy to measure. And so we're setting up a high throughput method to look at this. And for this, we've been using um, uh, connected neural cultures from the mouse brains. So you heard from Dr. McConnell how he can get these neural connections in the iPSC cells that he, neurons that he grows in culture. We can do the same thing with a mouse brain. We isolate a brain from a, a neonatal mouse. We put it in culture, grow it for 14 days so it will form neural connections. And then we can assess the calcium using a calcium sensitive dye. We can then put that into two different systems. One is a um, high throughput system that can measure 384 wells all at the same time. The other is using a calcium imaging system that is a little slower, but gives us more information about how the firing is happening within those connected neural cultures. And so um, we studied the neurons under a wide variety of ionic conditions, different levels of potassium and calcium, which can control neural activity. And what we found was that under some conditions, the neurons are very quiescent, 
Under others, they start showing hyperexcitability. In others, they show that very um, robust spiking behavior, which again, we could think about as potentially epilepsy in a dish or hyper, hyper excitability. And when we look at that, um, so I will skip the quiescent one because it's sort of boring. Uh, let's see if I can get my cursor over there. Do you see my cursor flying around there somewhere? Okay, great. So this is, the, this is in the presence of calcium and low potassium. You can see a very consistent spiking that's happening. That's these very high levels of spikes. And what you notice, let me do that again. What you notice is that basically they all spike at once. It's this connected spiking activity, and that's exactly what you see in a tonic-clonic seizure, where the whole brain gets activated pretty much at once. So the idea here then, we looked at um, different calcium and potassium levels and measured the amount of spiking behavior. We then looked at mutant and wild type neurons and we found one condition where the G203R mutant neurons showed increased spiking behavior compared to the wild type. We need to do more of these to nail this down, but the idea would be can we find a drug that will suppress the spiking activity in the mutant neurons but not in the normal neurons, so we could get specificity for the, the condition. And we have in our high throughput screening lab about 30,000 compounds, about 3,000 of which are known clinical drugs that could potentially be repurposed relatively quickly if we found one that would selectively suppress the hyperactivity of the mutant neurons versus the, the wild type neurons. So in summary, basically we have mice carrying um, epilepsy alleles, but they show severe seizures and are not viable, and we've got strategies to try to get around that. We, the mouse, mice with movement disorder neurons show quite different movement abnormalities, which was really very surprising to me, um, and I think we'll want to understand the clinical correlates better. We have some milestone delays, and we have the neural cultures where we've got a method set up to assess the activity of the neurons in 384 well plates, and we could potentially take the iPSC-derived neurons and do exactly the same thing with them with the systems we got in place. So we're interested in better understanding mechanisms, um, testing drugs, and potentially genetic therapies, and then we also are looking forward to collaborating with the other investigators in this room and, and elsewhere to try to move the science of GNAO1 mechanisms and biology forward. So I really have to thank Jade Huiji Feng in my lab. She's been, done a spectacular job. Um, unfortunately, she's probably leaving me in July because she's finishing up and hoping to do a postdoc at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in other epilepsies. Cassie Larave is a, a master's student. A number of other people have helped us, especially our transgenic, our spectacular transgenic core, Elena Demerova and Huirong Ji, made all four of these mutant mice for us, and they're very efficient in, in doing this. And also, I really have to thank the Bow Foundation for the funding, and also all of you, the GNA1 patients and families, for support, encouragement, and, and for just being um, the awesome folks that you are. Thank you. We've got time for one or two questions, if there's any questions for Dr. Nubik. If not, there's so, one back there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, Ilya. Good to see you. So you mentioned excitability of Does that also mean, is it only seizures or could that be also moments? You know, um, we actually think that there's probably hyperexcitability in the movement disorder as well. So a lot of movement disorders have hyperexcitability. It may depend on which brain region that happens. Um, we actually have some data, which I left out um, because... Um, I knew the time was going to be short, where we've actually used electrophysiology to measure the excitability of Purkinje cell, Purkinje cell neurons. Purkinje cells are in the cerebellum, and they um, control movements, as, as you heard from, from Amy. So um, we assess the excitability of, of Purkinje cells, or the, the firing of Purkinje cells, and we actually found that 
the inhibition of Purkinje cells. So Purkinje cells are, are um, have both excitatory inputs and inhibitory inputs. And when we look at the inhibitory inputs into the Purkinje cells, they are reduced. And if you've got reduced inhibitory inputs, you ought to see enhanced excitability. So we do see reduced inhibitory inputs into the Purkinje cells in the cerebellum, which would presumably lead to enhanced cerebellar signaling and perhaps excitability there, which may relate to the movement disorder. But the brain is so complicated. All, so many different areas are, are interconnected. It's not that simple, but we do see evidence in the slices from the brain of the cerebellum of the G203R mutant mice that there is inha reduced inhibitory signaling in the cerebellum, which would be consistent with an effect in the, in the movement disorder as well as the epilepsy. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, so we're, we're certainly interested in that. The main goal, so the way, what the study was about, was having some um, individuals come and, and have their movements assessed, both upper limb movements and lower limb movements in gait, very quantitative. Florian um, Kaver is a kinesiologist at MSU. The goal of that was to help us build um, methodologies where we could get very quantitative information from the patients. So if we did find a drug we thought would be beneficial, when we moved into clinical trials, um, clinical testing, we would have the tools we would need to assess that. Unfortunately, um, when I pitched that as part of my NIH grant, they said, no, no, that's awful, we shouldn't do that. So I pulled it out of the grant and sort of dialed that down. Um, there was just a call for proposals from NIH on ways to help set up clinical trials, and so we may be able to go back with that um, grant, it doesn't support the clinical trial, but it allows you to establish the methodologies for the clinical trial. And that's exactly what we were trying to do the first time. Now, two years later, I says, yeah, we want those. But the particular group that was reviewing my grant didn't think it was a good idea. So we, we are hoping to continue with that. Um, I think the levels of information are quite disparate, and we, we need to make connections between those. We aren't yet at the point where we